Um, so as Jan mentioned, I'm a, uh, I'm a PhD student at Columbia. I'm finishing up this summer, and then I'll be starting at the University of Washington in Seattle as a postdoc. Um, so this talk is um, basically the, the work I've done as part of my thesis and a little bit extra. Um, and it's describable visual attributes for face search and recognition. And you know, I know you're, you're probably not all face people, or maybe none of you are face people, but uh, this isn't going to be just faces, although it is you know, primarily faces. So in fact, let's start with, um, with dogs, right? So let's say we want to train a detector to recognize dogs uh, in images. And so if you look at these images of dogs, you see that there's a lot of variation in the way that dogs appear, right? Because there are different types of dogs, and they're photographed in all different conditions, and they look very different because of all these different reasons. And so it's very tough to build a detector that can reliably, or a classifier, if you will, that can reliably find dogs in images. So you know, one thing we could do is we could make the problem easier by saying, let's train a beagle detector. And so at this stage now, instead of saying all dogs, we're just trying to find beagles. And the hope is that this should be an easier problem, because beagles generally look a certain way. Right? So if you look at these images, they look a little bit more similar. And you could maybe imagine that this might be easier. But of course, the problem now is that you just need a huge number of detectors. Because beagles are one type of dog. And here I'm showing from ImageNet uh, the dog category. And uh, in fact, I haven't even expanded all the little sub-tabs. But this is two screens of different types of dogs. And then if you start looking at cats and other animals and plants and non-living things, you know, this list just goes on and on and on. And so it's not clear how you can scale a process where you have to train detectors for every single type of thing. So the other issue is that let's say we wanted to train a detector for just one dog, right? For my dog, I want to have a detector. So now you imagine that, in some senses, this problem is easier because my dog will have a very specific appearance. And there should be much less variation in the way that he appears over time. But on the other hand, um, you know, it's not clear that the same machinery you use to train a beagle detector or to train a general dog detector will work to detect my dog. Because for my dog, there are probably some very small distinguishing features that would be useful. Whereas to detect general dogs, you probably want some more general features that can be used to sort of quickly categorize uh, different, different uh, types of objects from each other. And then, of course, the other problem is that if you start looking at individual objects, there are just an incredible number of them, right? I mean, this is trillions of things that you have to start recognizing. So again, there's a scale issue, which is how do you, how do you expand out to, to this sort of scale to recognize all the different objects in the world? So you know, if you think about this, this is, these are sort of the, some of the fundamental questions in vision that people have in our field have been looking at for 30 or 40 years. But on the other hand, recognizing things is something that people have been doing forever. And people have been doing it forever, but you know, even in 2,000 years, people have been looking at it in a systematic way to try to, to, try to figure out ways of doing this. Right? And so this is a plate from De Materia Medica, which was a field guide written by Dioscorides in the first century. And what this book contained was illustrations and descriptions of different plant species, uh, with descriptions of how to, how to recognize them and then what their medicinal uses were. And this was widely copied, uh, obviously not published in those days, but widely copied and widely read because it was such a useful thing. And then, of course, more recently, in the 18th century, there was Carl Linnaeus' Systema Naturae, which forms the basis for modern taxonomy. Right? And I think what these two works have in common is that they both are efforts to teach readers how to identify an object, in this case, plant species, by describable visual attributes. And so what do I mean by this? Well, so let's say you have this leaf, and you have to describe to someone what, what, what this is. right? So you might say, well, it's a simple leaf as opposed to compound. It has five lobes. It has rounded sinuses. It, it has sharp teeth. It's as wide as it is long. It's flat, and so on. right? And using all of these terms, you could then say, oh, this must be a sugar maple, because it has all of these, these attributes. And so if you think of this, you know, this seems like, all right, this is, this is one way of describing things. Why is it? particularly better than any other. Right? And I think there are a couple of reasons why this is very attractive, this idea of having describable visual attributes. And so the, um, you know, the thing is, first of all, you can apply this to many different types of objects. Right? So you could describe animals, for example, this tiger, as having four legs. It's orange. It's striped. It's furry. In a completely different domain, like architecture, you could describe the White House as being white, symmetric, with ionic columns, and built in the classical style. Right? And then in the domain I'm going to talk about today, faces, we of course use attributes all the time. Right? That's the primary way we describe people. 
we say that this person is male, he's Asian, he has a beard, he's smiling, and so on. And so, you know, I think one of the first benefits of attributes is that they're generalizable. And what this means is that if you have attributes for these three animals, right, and so here are a bunch of attributes that apply to, to these animals, well, now if you see a new animal that you've never seen before, right, so in this case, let's say we look at a bald eagle, you find that, again, there are some attributes that you've already used that can be used to describe this new, new object that you've never seen before. And in fact, it's even better, right, because you can look at um, a mythical animal like a griffin, right, and even though it doesn't exist, it's so different from everything else, you can still find attributes that describe it because you're describing sort of aspects of its appearance. Um, so I think that's the first sort of key benefit of attributes, is that existing attributes can describe novel categories. The second thing is that attributes are composable. And so this means that if you have a number of faces like this and you want to describe different categories of people, right? So you can describe a very general category of all females, or you could add more attributes together to describe more and more specific categories, right? And so you can use four attributes together to get down to sort of one person, right? And so at this point, you're describing this one person out of the 30 that we started with. And in fact, it's even better, right? Because you can not only describe categories or, or sort of uh, classes of objects, but even specific instances of objects, right? So we could even go down to a level like this, saying Caucasian people with teeth showing outside with the tilted head to describe a specific instance or a specific image of, of an object. Um, and so I think this is the second sort of key benefit of attributes, which is that attributes can be combined for different specific specificities. And I think this gets at you know, the point I raised earlier with the dog detector, where you could imagine having a few attributes to describe dogs, a few more to describe beagles, and a few more to describe my dog, right? Using the same framework. All you're doing is just adding more attributes. And finally, uh, I think a third key benefit of, of attributes is that they're quite efficient, right? So using one attribute, we can filter a list by a factor of two, by another factor of two, and so on, right? And so in theory, you know, k attributes can distinguish two to the k different categories. Now, of course, in practice, this isn't really true because, you know, not all attributes are going to be equally discriminative. They're not all going to be, uh, you're not going to be able to use them accurately all the time and so on. But on the other hand, so far I've been mentioning sort of binary attributes. But if you imagine having continuous valued or, or multi-valued attributes, then the, the base on this exponent, uh, 2 to the k, could be much higher. And so, you know, it's not clear that, that this is really an upper bound. Um, so, you know, I was thinking of, about all of this when I first joined Columbia. So Peter, um, Peter Bellumer, my advisor, has this project on the electronic field guide, um, which has been ongoing for eight years or so. And so when I joined, I didn't start on this project, but I sort of was aware of it and saw what was going on. And then, you know, I knew this stuff about the field guides from the past and Dioscorides and all these things. And I was thinking, you know, it would be really great to have attributes for general vision for exactly these reasons I just mentioned. You know, it, it could provide a real, a new way of looking at these problems that people have been looking at for 20, 30 years. Um, and so, you know, this was 2007, I guess, and I was really excited because I was like, all right, I'm going to be the first one to do this. But of course, you know, I'm not the first one to do this. Uh, I was beaten to the punch, although surprisingly, only just. Um, so I think the first real paper to look at this kind of stuff was by Ferrari and Zisserman in 2007, uh, NIPS, called Learning Visual Attributes. And here in this paper, they showed how you can train attributes for some simple things like you know, the red color or for dot, dots or stripes and things like that. And they showed some results for object recognition. But I think philosophically, this paper was very much on the same line. And, and you know, they mentioned some of these points that, that I just talked about. Um, and then recently, you know, there's just been expl an explosion of papers dealing with attributes. And so here I show just a small sampling of uh, the papers and, and attributes from the last couple of years with my papers highlighted in orange. Um, and you know, this year in CVPR, I've shown five papers here. I think there are more like 10 on attributes. It's just incredible. Um, this area is really taking off, which is really exciting for me. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it's taking off a lot and there's been all this work. But the first paper I've listed here is from 2007, right? And that's not very long. You know, I mentioned Dioscorides' book from the first century so why has it taken 2,000 years for us to really sort of get at this uh, in a computational sense? And I think, you know, there are a couple of reasons for that. The, um, the first reason is that to be useful, we need lots and lots of attributes. It doesn't help if you just have one attribute to describe something or two attributes, right? So if you need lots and lots of attributes, so that's a bottleneck, right? You have to have some way of training lots and lots of attributes. 
The second thing is the attribute, the classifiers you train for an attribute have to be reliable. It doesn't do you any good if the attribute, if the classifier you train doesn't reliably work. Um, and so if you combine these two things together, the fact that you need lots of attributes and they have to be reliable, I think machine learning techniques have only recently sort of caught up to being able to handle this kind of stuff. Uh, and because you have to do this automatically, there's no way you can sit around and sort of hand design features or classifiers for each attribute. You just have to do this automatically. And I think the second, I mean, so, so the way to train lots of attributes, uh, attribute classifiers automatically is by having lots of data. So I think that's the first thing, is you need lots and lots of images. And you guys know better than almost anyone that you know, the internet is so fantastic for this. I mean, now we can get millions of images, and not just any images, but real world images, images that are not taken in a lab, but images that have all the kinds of variation that you see in real world, in real life situations. And secondly, we need lots of labels. So we need to be able to label these images to have a ground truth set to train our classifiers. And this also has become much easier now thanks to things like Mechanical Turk. So, OK, so so far I've been talking about attributes from sort of a philosophical standpoint, right? But let's get down to sort of computer vision, right? Let's do some actual computation with this. And so my talk is going to be structured uh, in this way where we basically follow this pipeline uh, around. And this pipeline is sort of a fairly standard pipeline. Uh, so we have an image source S. Uh, and from this image source, we gather lots of images, I. And then from each image, we extract a number of low-level features, F of I. And then these low level features are the inputs to our attribute classifiers, A. Um, and then what we do is we just run this on our database and we build a database of attributes. So in this database, we have images and we have attributes for the images. And then uh, at runtime, we have a new input image, uh, J. And then from this, we again extract low level features. We extract the, the attributes using the classifiers. And finally, the, the key thing is this composition function C. Um, and so most of my talk is going to be spent talking about different composition functions C that we can use uh, to do different types of things with these attributes. And then finally, you know, from the composition function, you get some sort of result which you display to the user in some way. So of course, you know, this is a very generic pipeline, and I'm not claiming credit for the whole pipeline. But I think what I've shown in my thesis is sort of concretely, how do you build these attribute classifiers in an automatic and reliable way, and for one specific domain, for faces? And then also, over the course of the couple of papers I've published, I've shown a few specific examples of composition functions that, um, that can be used to, to really do something useful with these attributes. So, um, so in this talk, I'm going to mention uh, a few of the works I've done on faces. Um, in particular, I'm not going to talk about the face replacement work, uh, but I'll talk about the other three. And then uh, I'll also talk about some non-face stuff at the end. So, OK. So how do we train an attribute classifier? Right? So here's this, this pipeline that I just showed you. And so you know, this piece right here, right now, is just a box. Well, let's see what's, what's in this box. So let's start at the beginning. We have our image source, the internet, and we gather images from it. So here I am gathering images. I'm gathering more, more, and more. And so this is our data set. This is 3 million face images. Uh, each pixel here is like 25 images or so. And if you compare this to existing face data sets, it's just much, much bigger. right? And not just bigger, but I think more importantly, it's a real world data set. All these other data sets uh, were collected in, in a lab setting. And so what you find is that no matter how careful you are in trying to get sort of the kind of variation that you need, you always mess something up. right? So people, you, know, you might have the same background. You might have you know, a limited set of people. You might have just a few poses. You might have just a few lighting conditions. You might have the same camera for all of them. Right? There are all these things that you don't think about, or they might all be shot sort of in nice quality. But when you gather stuff from the web, you find all kinds of stuff. You find things taken by all different cameras, using different lenses, in different conditions, with blur, with JPEG artifacts. You know, all these things that you have to deal with when you look at real world images and that you just don't see if you take images in the lab. So OK, so now we have images. Um, we, need to, we need some sort of labeling service that will let us label these images. And so you know, ideally, what we want to do is we want to randomly choose a subset of our images and get them labeled. So we might choose a subset and say, all right, let's label the gender on these images. Let's choose another subset, label whether they're wearing glasses or not, or the hair color, or the age, or ethnicity, or eyebrow type, or you know, all this different stuff. But what we need, ideally, is you know, a few hundred to a few thousand labels for each attribute. And we want to have lots and lots of attributes. 